Well, greetings, everybody. It's high noon in Chicago, and um, I hear strange tribal theme music, which can only mean one thing. It's time for yet another fall publishing webinar. I'm Chris Bates, editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazines and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next 50 minutes or so as we tackle today's topic, weed rotation uh, excuse me, weed management in container nurseries, selecting the best options and product rotations for your crops. Now, uh, show of hands, uh, figuratively speaking, of course, who among you is fighting the never-ending thick jungle of weeds in your pots or around your nursery or both? Yeah, just like I thought. Every single hand in the house just went up. In fact, I see some of you raising both hands which is why I selected that jungly theme music, and it's also why uh, we're doing today's webinar. Now, as usual, I am not the expert on the topic. I've certainly pulled my share of weeds, but uh, managing them, hardly. But I've got a guy today who knows more about weeds and how to get rid of them just, than just about anybody I know. He is Dr. Joe Neal. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. All right. Now, Joe, the fun thing about webinars is that you can do them from – pretty much any place on the planet where you have an internet connection. Where are you uh, broadcasting from today? I am in beautiful, sunny Raleigh, North Carolina. Raleigh, how are things down in Raleigh these days? Oh, my goodness. You know, things are uh, – sure signs of spring are everywhere. The crabgrass is up. The dandelion has finished flowering and is dropping its seeds. <laughs> <laughs> I should have I should have known that you would look at spring – from a weed point of view. And, and actually, that leads to a question. I want to know what sort of weed season, maybe you can't answer this question, but what sort of weed season are we anticipating for 2016? You know, every year is a good we year for weeds. Uh, you know, they just are well adapted to whatever Mother Nature throws at us. And, um, and it's the one pest complex that we can count on every year. That's called job security to you, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, as usual, your host is uh, working the controls from high atop the ball publishing broadcast studios, palatial, I should add, just west of Chicago, uh, where we have weeds as well. Uh, but today feels like March. It's 40-something uh, and kind of, uh, kind of overcast, and we're expecting rain tonight, and of course, the weeds love that, too. But uh, a couple of housekeeping things as we get going. I hope everybody's uh, got good audio. We're actually using a different system for the first time ever on our ball publishing webinars, and that is VoIP, or Voice Over Internet Protocol. And I'm hoping it's giving you uh, a higher fidelity uh, audio experience. If you're not hearing anything, it's because either you don't have your computer speakers on or you're using a computer from uh, 1993 that doesn't have speakers. But hopefully you've got good audio. If not, well, you're not even hearing me say this. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not only a moot point, it's a mute point. But there will be an archive of the, of the webinar as we go along. But first, some housekeeping. I want to give a special uh, shout-out to our sponsor, BASF, um, for supporting uh, this webinar and making it free to the industry. Um, as we go along, uh, you are probably bound to have some questions. If so, use the little chat area that you see on the control panel on the right. That's the easiest way for me to follow. There is a Q&A area that you can also use, and it's a little bit more challenging. Use the chat area. Type in your, your, your question. We'll attack them as we go along if they're pertinent to what we're talking to. Um, and we'll, if not, we'll get to them at the end. Um, and if we still can't get to it or if it's too complicated to handle here, um, we're going to give you Joe's private email address. So how about that? Um, and as I was saying, if you, if you uh, either can't hear right now or you get kicked off because your computer system or a customer comes in and you have to take care of them, this webinar will be archived uh, along with all of our others, at ballpublishing.com slash webinars. It's coincidentally the same place you signed up. So I think that is all my housekeeping, and nobody's sending in any little notes saying, Chris, we can't hear you, so that's always a good sign. Joe, are you all set? I'm ready. All right, take her away. Okay, so uh, today's topic obviously is a focus on uh, container nursery weed management, but I want to approach it from a... Uh, uh, decision tree uh, model. So in other words, how do we go about making a decision? Well, just as background, you know, in container nurseries, you know, we are very dependent on pre-emergent herbicide applications. We have lots of products available 
Uh, and we have to do multiple applications each year. In the south, we're doing five to six applications per year. In cooler regions of the country, you, you might be able to get away with uh, with fewer. Uh, three applications is not unusual in the uh, in the cooler regions of the country. Um, but one of the challenges that we face right now is we have so many choices. I mean, just look at this list of of many of the the herbicides available to you, uh, to, you know, to choose from. So, how do you choose the best one? You need kind of a you need some kind of a structure to do so. And this is what's sometimes called a decision tree. And and this image. Uh, shows a decision tree sort of in its simplest form. You're growing a particular crop species. Is what herbicide is labeled, yes or no? If the herbicide is labeled, you could use it, but then you have the decision to make, does it control the weeds that you have, yes or no? So again, in its simplest form, this is how a decision tree works. Um, next. So, one of the first decisions you have to make, or one of the, the first criteria uh, that impacts your decision about which herbicide you might use, uh, is to look at major questions. One, am I controlling weeds in the crop, or am I doing a sanitation treatment around the nursery? Am I controlling weeds in newly potted plants or liners versus established larger containers? Is the area covered uh, structure, or will I be covering that structure? Is, as I said before, is it newly potted or is it established? And of course, what type of crop am I growing? Woody, herbaceous, grasses, conifers, uh, all have different, um, there are different herbicides labeled for all of these different situations. And every herbicide is going to have a section on it with special warnings, with language that says, do not use this herbicide on fill in the blank, a list of crops. And that is one of the very important parts of every herbicide label that you should look at. Next. Now, let's start looking first at what's going on around the nursery to prevent weeds from getting into your crop. So sanitation treatments for your bare ground areas, okay, uh, gravel areas or, or soil areas around the nursery. What I, I usually recommend are applications of pretty broad spectrum products like SureGuard, plus or minus barricade, or Marengo. Uh, these products provide long residual weed control, good broad spectrum weed control. If you're growing herbaceous perennials, you might want to choose a product like a gallery barricade that should there be some spray drift or splashing or lateral movement into your production areas, you're much less likely to get any crop injury. Now, which ones do you, which one would you choose besides the presence or absence of tender herbaceous plants uh, really depends on the weeds you have in the area. Now, for example, you know, Marengo is quite good on Eclipta. So if you've got a lot of Eclipta during the summer months, Marengo is a good choice. Uh, Spurge, it's also very good on Spurge. SureGuard is, is really good on Spurge and, and Phylanthus species that, that may be encroaching into your, your nursery. Uh, they're both good on, on Bittercress. Uh, Barricade by itself is very good on Spurge, but would miss the Eclipta and the Phylanthus and, the, uh, and is a little weak on Bittercress late in the season. So you want to take a look at the weed species that have been dominant in your nursery at that time of year and select the most appropriate one. Next. But what about in the crop itself? Well, it depends on what crop you're growing. For example, in this image, we've got a crop of, of hollies. You know, nice, uh, vigorous, woody crop like that. We have lots of herbicide options to choose from. We could use liquid applications. We can use granular products. But bottom line, we can use very broad spectrum uh, herbicides. That's not necessarily the case for other crop species. 
In liner production, we have very few herbicide options available. So number one, you want rooted cuttings rooted before any herbicides are applied. Okay, so when we talk about a liner, we're talking about something that has already established a root system. Uh, in those situations, you want to use a product. If you're going to use herbicides, you want to make sure you're using something that is not a root inhibiting herbicide. And we just have relatively few of those, Ronstar, Regal OO, and Pennant Magnum are the, the products that are most commonly used. Now, of course, Pennant Magnum is only available as a sprayable formulation. And Ronstar uh, and the Regal OO are both available as, uh, as granular formulations. Now, if you're a conifer grower up in, uh, in Oregon, then of course there are a few other products that you might use. You might be able to use some spray applications of Goal as well. But in liner production, as you see in this photograph, this grower could use herbicides in this site because it is open air. It has shade structure on it. It might get covered at one at some point during the year, but it is open air. So pre-emergence herbicides can be used in the crop. Right now, if you're propagating under cover, there are no herbicides that can be used in liner production under or in covered structures. No pre-emergence herbicides, I should clarify. Okay. Now, if you're growing herbaceous crops in out, let's, well, let's turn our attention to outdoor production rather than, than liner production. Next. In outdoor production, we're, we're taking our liners and moving them up to, to uh, larger pots. And the size of that liner can make a big difference in the herbicide you choose. Okay. For example, what you're looking at here uh, is a, uh, our seedling wax myrtles. And this is standard uh, seedling wax myrtle that is uh, grown in container production in the Carolinas. Uh, and when they are first transplanted, you can get severe injury if you use Broadstar or Freehand or Marengo or Tower uh, on those seedlings. However, if you delay those applications for another eight weeks or so, then giving those seedlings a chance to establish and get some basal diameter, then you can use those very same herbicides. And the product labels reflect this. Broadstar in particular says don't use uh, Broadstar on newly potted one gallon or smaller uh, crop plants. And this is why it's these young transplants that can be damaged by an application. Similarly, you know, for many years we've known that azaleas can be damaged by too high a dose of a dinitroaniline herbicide. Now, dinitroaniline herbicides are part of almost all of our pre-emergence herbicides, our combination products such as OH2, biathlon, freehand, snapshot. They all contain a dinitroaniline that is a, we think of primarily as a root inhibitor, but for very young plants and very young azaleas in particular, uh, you can get some stem girdling right at the soil line if you use them on too young a crop. Okay, so a lot of times we like to see something else used right at transplant. So again, newly potted rooted cuttings can be very sensitive to certain plant, to certain herbicides. And here are a few images of what happens if you get Broadstar on some of these crops too early in their life cycle. So again, Look at the caution statements on the labels, and if the if the label says don't use it, for example, on young newly potted liners or bare root liners until they have established, this is why. Now, of course, the type of crop you're growing will have a tremendous impact on your weed management options and the herbicide options. You know, if you're growing an herbaceous perennial, 
uh, such as you see on the left, then you're going to have fewer herbicide options than if you're growing shade trees on the right. And in that shade tree uh, production area, you're going to have much, uh, a much larger assortment of pre-emergence herbicides, but also a larger assortment of post-emergence weed control options available to you. So let's talk about selecting the best herbicide. First and foremost, your number one consideration is safety to the crop. So next. So we'll, you know, whatever we do, we need to make sure that this herb, that the herbicide you choose is safe on the crop. Next. Now, how do we do that? Again, let's take a look at our sort of decision tree. If you look at the, the, the crop itself, it may not be just the species that you're growing, but the type of crop you're growing can separate a lot of decisions. So for example, if you're growing herbaceous ornamentals, within herbaceous ornamental production, you've got grass, ornamental grass production, and you have dicot production that are going to have different uh, options available to them. So under the grasses, what kinds of weed management solutions are possible? Post-emergence broadleaf weed control, there are a few herbicides for that. We have a herbicide for pre-emergence broadleaf weed control. Gallery can be used on a lot of ornamental grasses for, for that purpose. But controlling grass weeds is going to be more of a challenge in ornamental grass production. It's going to require probably more hand weeding for grass weeds and more attention to the history of weeds in your production area. If you've got areas uh, with heavy, uh, heavy dominance of grassy weeds, you need to take a step back and look at why those grasses are there and if there's anything I can do to prevent those grasses from becoming more of a problem in my grass production. Similarly, you know, if you're growing broadly for dicot or herbaceous ornamentals, you've got, you know, aspects of those crops that will affect your weed management decisions. For example, is this an herbaceous perennial that dies back to the ground uh, in the winter and comes back from an, a uh, storage organ, such as a peony, you know, or a hosta? If it dies back all the way to the ground, you have the option of doing some post-emergence weed control in those pots that you don't have if it's an evergreen perennial or a perennial that just does not go fully dormant, like our rudbeckias and echinaceas in our climate really don't don't always go go dormant completely. So, you know, in that in that dormant uh, season, if you've got weedy pots of hostas you can use a post-emergent spray to clean up the bitter grass and oxalis that might have come up into in those pots. You can use diquat for that purpose. Uh, but if it's an evergreen uh, plant, then obviously you're going to be left with more hand weeding. In the dicot crops, we have a lot more options for grass control. We have pre-emergence herbicides. We have post-emergence herbicides that could take grasses out of our dicots. Okay but we don't have as good an option for broadleaf weed control in our herbaceous perennial production. So we're left with a lot more hand weeding and you just have to plan for that, right? So what about woody production? Let's, let's move into uh, you know, talking about that. We have a lot more options available. Next. In woody nursery crops, we have a lot more options because our crops will tolerate the herbicides, okay? We have broad spectrum herbicides like, like OH2 and Route and Biathlon and Broadstar and Snapshot and Freehand and Marango and boy, the list goes on and on. Well, how do I choose these? And here are a few of my sort of rules of thumb, okay? OH2, Route and Biathlon have a lot of the very same active ingredients. Okay, it's oxiflorophin plus a dinitroanilin herbicide. They are very similar in many, many ways, and they are safe on most of our woody crops. There are a few exceptions, and they're going to be listed on the label in the precaution section. Okay, and this chemistry has been in the marketplace for a long, long time. So we have high confidence in, in what we know about these products. Now, Broadstar and Marengo are a little different. 
Okay, they can be a little more injurious on young plants. Uh, we know they're safe on, on conifers, junipers, arborvitae. Uh, if you're going, if you're stepping plants up to three gallon or larger uh, pots, then you know these, these herbicides are quite safe on a broad range of plants, but on smaller, younger plants, we do need to exercise a little more caution in their use. Now, snapshot or freehand, uh, we know that these uh, are a little safer to, to the crop. In other words, they're, if the granules of snapshot or freehand get caught on the foliage or lodged in the leaf axles, you're not going to get that burning type uh, injury usually. You know, that, that is often associated with an OH2, a route, biathlon, Broadstar or, or even Ronstar granules that get caught in the growing points or caught on the leaves. So, you know, we think of snapshot and freehand as, as more of a non-burning type type herbicides, uh, but they may not provide quite as broad a spectrum uh, of weed control or control some of our really tough to control species as well as uh, as a Marengo, for example. So we have lots of choices. However, move into herbaceous perennial production, we have, we have very few choices of pre-emergence herbicides labeled for use in herbaceous perennials. Now, with fewer herbicides, why? Because there's much greater potential for injury. Now, for example, uh, through my years of, of research, I found that, that Pendulum 2G has been one of the safest pre-emergence herbicides for weed control in herbaceous perennial production. Okay, Snapshot is widely used, and I'm sure a lot of the people on this, uh, on this webinar are, are saying, well, I've used Snapshot. It is widely used, but we know it can injure a number of common species, in particular, Phlox paniculata, Sedum, Stachys, Veronica, Dianthus. Uh, you know, if you've if you have not applied snapshot to those those species, um, good for you. Uh, but chances are, if you are using snapshot on your perennial production, you may have seen some stunting or uh, foliar damage on uh, on those species, and hopefully are now avoiding it. Next. So, like I said, Pendulum 2G has been. Uh, pretty safe on a wide range of herbaceous ornamentals in my trials, and here are just a few pictures of some of the uh, some of the studies that we have done. Uh, and you know, we found you know very few instances of uh, of injury uh, from Pendulum 2G. Next, but we do know that Snapshot provides broader spectrum weed control. Okay, so you know, I, I often say that that you know, if a herbicide is really effective for broadleaf weed control, that herbicide is going to have a higher potential for injury to herbaceous ornamental crops. So Pendulum 2G controls spurge; it controls annual grasses but it is weak on a lot of the other broadleaf weeds that are common in nurseries, and we have to plan to do a little more uh, active hand weeding if that's the product we're using. Um, so if we can use Snapshot, it gives us a little broader spectrum weed control, and it is labeled for a number of herbaceous ornamentals, as you see listed on this screen, but it also has a list on there of, of species for which you should not use it. Coneflower, foxglove, lamb's quarters, phlox, uh, dicentra, and iberis, and there, there are quite a few more on the list. So really check your, your inventory of plants you're growing against that list that says do not use uh, to make sure that you're not injuring your crop. All righty. So, Almost every herbicide label has some of these special precautions. So it's not just on herbaceous ornamentals either. There are some woody uh, plants that are injured by, um, by our pre-emergence herbicides. For example, certain cultivars of azalea have been injured by OH2. And if you look on the label, it's going to provide that information. 
when we first began our research with Snapshot, um, I was working in upstate New York at Cornell University where Euonymus Alatus Compacta production is, is a was a very important um, it was a very important crop to the growers there, and it really surprised a lot of people when Snapshot started causing injury on Euonymus Alatus Compacta. Okay, but um, I say this and I show this picture there. Who would have ever thought that Fusilade would cause severe injury to a ground cover juniper? Well, if you look carefully on the Fusilade label. Fusilade's label for controlling weedy grasses in lots of different junipers, but if you look carefully on the label, it does say that injury to Bar Harbor juniper is common. So now, if you have trouble telling Bar Harbor juniper apart from blue rug juniper, I know how you can tell them apart. And of course, this is a joke part. It, doesn't work quite as well when I can't hear you laughing. Next. I'm sure they're all laughing. Uh, <laughs> all across the country and around the world, they're chuckling at their computers right now. A and making a note not to apply this to their blue-green universe. <laughs> a good belly laugh. All right. Um, okay, so when we're selecting our best herbicide, obviously the very first thing we have to consider is the safety of the crop. Next. But next, you know, once we know a herbicide is safe on our crop, the next thing we need to know is, well, will it control the weeds that we have? So we want to choose the most effective herbicide for the weeds that you have on a nursery. So how do you do that? Well, for, for efficacy and information about weeds, you need some resources. Well, where do you get information on the effectiveness of different herbicides? We've my colleague uh, Jeff Durr and I put together a, uh, a bulletin on weeds of container nurseries in the United States. This contains photographs and descriptions and weed control information on the 36 most common weeds of container nurseries. And you think 36, that's not very many, but we find that we've, in looking at weeds of container nurseries throughout the United States and actually internationally, we find that those 36 species account for the vast majority of weeds that you'll encounter in container nurseries. Uh, this uh, publication, the content of this is available online, so all you have to do is type into your search engine weeds of container nurseries and you know it will pop up in your search engine. If you want a hard copy, they are for sale from our North Carolina Nursery and Landscape Association. Uh, and I want to point out that you know just today, after using this slide set for uh, quite some time, I find now that I typed in the wrong URL or the wrong website. It is the North Carolina Nursery and Landscape Association, ncnla.com, uh, uh, if you wanted to purchase a copy. Oh, so what we have there, NCAN, is not correct, in other words. That's correct. So that is say, right. say it one more time. The, uh, well, again, I would suggest just type in North Carolina Nursery and Landscape Association, and their website will pop up. There you go. Yeah. All righty. So when we're talking efficacy, you know, one thing I think we all recognize is that some weeds will really just define our weed control program and, and will tell us, I need to use this herbicide if I possibly can. Okay, we know we're going to have a complex of weeds. We're not dealing with just one weed, but when you have a particular weed that's difficult to control, that's the one you need to think think carefully about, it's like, what herbicide can I choose that will give me better control of this difficult weed and keep it, either get it under control or keep it from spreading. Next. For example, your, every nursery has bittercress. I'm convinced there's not a nursery in the continental U.S. that does not have bittercress in it at some point in time. All right. So, I've looked at bittercress, you know, weed control for a lot of years, and almost 
every year, year in, year out, this is what I've found is that any herbicide that contains oxifluorophen is going to provide you provide you the best bitter press control. So anything that contains oxifluorophen, for example, OH2, Rout, uh, Biathlon, the um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the Herald's, you know, HGH, all contain oxifluorophen. Okay, Regal OO is quite good as well. Okay, Ronstar is good, not quite as good as the products that have uh, uh, oxifluorophen in it. Okay, um, Broadstar and Marango are quite good. Freehand appear, seems to perform well in the late spring and summer months, but not quite as well over winter. Snapshot, on the other hand, seems to work consistently in the cooler season. Okay, look. Well, I should say works more consistently in the cooler season than it has in the warmer times of year on bitter cress. Okay. And fairly consistently we get poor to only fair control of bitter cress from the dinitrous aniline herbicides, pendulum and, and barricade. So if you look at this list of um, the efficacy, you can see our broader spectrum products that we can use on woody plants you know, are going to give us our best bitter press control, whereas the products that are safer for our herbaceous uh, plant production, Pendulum, for example, is going to get our weakest bitter press control. So when we know we only have a marginally effective product for that weed, if that's the only herbicide we can we can use, you ask that question, is it worth using it? And the answer, the easy answer is yes. The pre-emergence herbicide will control other weeds and it will reduce the populations of this weed in the crops. But just be aware that there will be escapes and you've got to hand weed those. All right, so bitter cress is our number one uh, weed of cool season uh, crops, cropping systems. Our most common weed, or should I say weeds, of warm season cropping systems uh, are uh, spurges. And there are several different species of spurge that are quite common uh, in nursery crops. We almost all have spotted spurge, and that's photographed on the left of your screen. And spotted spurge can be spotted or it can lack the spots, okay? Um, often, called prostrate spurge, but that's actually not accurate because there is a species called prostrate spurge and it does differ slightly in its uh, susceptibility to some of the herbicides. Okay, uh, in the deep south and we have other species in the middle of this photograph, you'll see there's a picture of garden spurge. That's one I had to stop doing research on because it kept spreading and getting into my other spurges. Okay. Fortunately, even though it spreads so rapidly and germinates so rapidly, fortunately it is fairly easily uh, controlled by pre-emergent herbicides. They're, they're, all, they're mostly quite effective. Uh, and the other picture you, you see on the bottom right-hand side of this, this slide, it looks a lot like the spotted spurge or what we might consider prostrate spurge, and this one actually is uh, Euphorbia prostrata or prostrate ground mat. And, uh, and it, it is very, its control is similar to spotted spurge, but it tends to be um, not quite as well controlled by the same dose. So it might need a little higher dose of, the, of an herbicide to get equivalent control. Uh, but otherwise, nearly identical. Now, overall, what's the best uh, control of spurge that I've had in my research? Broadstar, Barricade, Marengo, Freehand, and any other products containing those active ingredients. So for example, Tower has same, one of the same active ingredients as Freehand, and SureGuard has the same active ingredient as Broadstar, all right? Um, the oxifluorophen-based herbicides, Biathlon, OH2, Route, HGH, uh, they sometimes give good control and other times poor control. So they're not as consistent 
as the the other uh, products listed under the best. Okay. Similarly, I've had very good control of Spurge with Snapshot, and I've had poor control with Snapshot. And so it's it can be variable. Pendulum is generally quite good on on uh, Spurge, but again, I've had some variability from one season to the next. One thing you can almost always count on is that uh, reliance on Ronstar and OH2, you're going to get only fair to poor control with those. You'll see a big difference uh, in the Spurge control um, depending upon the dose of Ronstar you apply. If you apply the highest label dose, you'll get some fair control. If you apply the lowest label dose, you're going to get poor control. So if you recall, when we were talking about liner production and the only herbicide you might have available would be something like Ronstar or Regal OO um, or similar products with the same active ingredients, you know, you're going to um, you're going to have a higher likelihood of spurge being an important weed in those situations. Right. Joe, we've got one question that's come in um, okay. on the topic of spurge. Uh, dimension. How well does dimension die uh, die uh, work for spurge? Uh, yeah, uh, dimension is quite effective on uh, on spurge control. Now, I think of dimension as most commonly uh, used in turf grass systems. Okay, uh, partly because it's of the expense. It's it's more expensive than uh, than the other products we have uh, for uh, for spurge control in nurseries, uh, and tends to have a little narrower spectrum of activity. Um, but if you're going with a spray program and you need an, another herbicide for spurge control to rotate with your barricade, uh, then Dimension is a very effective alternative. All right, excellent. And to everybody else who's asked questions, don't worry, we'll get to them. I just wanted to take that one because it was it was on the topic of that slide. Okay. Now, what about in in the South? Eclipta is king, king of the weeds, because we really don't have very good herbicides for controlling Eclipta. The very best treatment for Eclipta control that I have have seen is Marengo. Okay. Uh, Broadstar and Freehand will provide fair control of, of Eclipta and the OH2 route, Regal OO, Snapshot, essentially all the rest provide poor or no control. So if you are battling Eclipta in your roadways or in your crop, okay, um, you will want to try to uh, to utilize Marengo for sanitation treatments and and also perhaps in your crops where you can. Now, moving to our more northern climates, uh, willow herb is one of our most important weeds. Now, willow herb, of course, is wind dispersed, and there are very few herbicides that are truly effective. Uh, now. Uh, I'll apologize, I left out uh, one of the most effective herbicides from this slide. The best herbicides for controlling willow herb uh, in my trials have been Ronstar, Freehand, and Broadstar. Okay, so, and that, that research also uh, has been done up in, um, in Oregon. Dr. James Altland uh, did some work with willow herb in, in Oregon and found very similar results that uh, Ronstar, Freehand, Broadstar all provided good pre-emergence weed control. Now, this is one of those weeds that uh, it, it germinates, it forms a very small seedling, and that seedling can sit there as a, just a very small plant for a fairly long time before it it seems to, to grow. So it must need to establish a good strong root system before it really starts its uh, top growth. And so this is one where you might miss the population with your pre-emergence herbicide application. You might not see those tiny seedlings that are already germinated. And remember our, our pre-emergence herbicides by and large have little or no effect on those seedlings once they've already germinated and begun to establish. So 
Uh, this is one to, to make sure you, you get the treatments out before they germinate. And if they've already germinated, you know, disturb those seedlings with hand weeding or, or uh, what we've jokingly referred to as micro-cultivation in the pots uh, before your pre-emergent herbicide is applied. Joseph says that yep. the willow herb at his nursery has become very resistant to gallery. Have you heard that? Well, in my experience, gallery never worked on willow herb very well. So uh, I've, I've not heard of any specifically resistant populations, um, but I've never really heard of gallery working well. But I would be curious to hear from from um, uh, from him to if gallery did in fact work for him in the past and doesn't anymore. Uh, that would be news to me. All right. Which leads to another question, or one of our, in fact, was our first question: um, Do you use herbicides in a rotation for resistance management? Yes, and we're going to talk about that specifically in just a bit. All right, so good. let me let me table that one for a moment. All right, let's and, move but on. bring the question up again if uh, if we need to. All right, so another important weed in the southern United States uh, is Phylanthus. And actually, before you in this slide are two species. Uh, one is Phylanthus tenellus and one is Phylanthus urinaria. The middle one is tenellus or long-stalked Phylanthus, tends to get tall. Um, sort of a tall and thin growing plant, but more common in container nurseries than the Phylanthus urinaria, which is on the left-hand side. Okay, these are plants that used to be in the spurge family. They've reallocated them to their own family now, the Phylanthaceae. Okay, and they are actually quite different than the spurges. A lot of herbicides that work on spurges do not work on the Phylanthus. So, for example, what we have found that provide the best and most consistent phylanthus control are Broadstar and Moringa. And they both control both species. Okay. OH2, Route, Biathlon, Bronstar, and Regal OO uh, all work well. They seem to work a little better on the long stalk than on the chamber chamber bitter. Okay. Freehand also works better on the long stalked than it does on the chamber bitter. Fortunately, chamber bitter is more of a landscape and turf weed, and the long stalk is the main one that we're doing we're dealing with. Uh, the other herbicides just have little or no activity on uh, phylanthus. So if you're battling phylanthus, it is a warm season weed. You want to have your app, your summer program will should include one of these treatments that provides good control, good or or excellent control of the phylanthus. Remember also that the phylanthus has explosively dehiscent seed pods, so once it's up, it can spread and it can have multiple generations per year, um, like many of our our container weeds. All right, so we've got all these really effective herbicides, but we continue to get weeds, and we have to spend money pulling them. Well, why, why, do, we, why do weeds keep coming up? Let's take a look at that question. With, whenever you apply a, a herbicide to your substrate, and you look at this graph over time, and that, that x-axis is the weeks after we apply the herbicide, you can see your weed control starts to drop off. And for example, this is for crabgrass. I just pulled this one uh, because it had it, because it had nice curves. All right. The broad star is not as good on crabgrass control as some of our other herbicides. But if you if you look at the crabgrass control on day zero, in other words, if I put crabgrass seed in the pot on the day that I apply the Ronstar, we got almost 100% control of that crabgrass. If I put crabgrass seed in that same pot four weeks later, we get only about 55% control of the crabgrass seedlings. And by six weeks, we're essentially getting no control. 
Compare that to our snapshot treatment that is better on crabgrass. And you can see you, the, the crabgrass control lasts longer. Okay, we've done this kind of research with, with, with crabgrass, with bittercress, with spurge, with eclipta, with phylanthus, and we've been able to do some comparisons of our efficacy based on how long the herbicides last. Now, next slide. So based on some of this research, we came up with these, these guidelines a number of years ago that if you had Eclipta, what we found was Broadstar gave us about three weeks of effective weed control. Snapshot and OH2, only one to two weeks of effective bittercress control. If you look at, uh, excuse me, ecliptic control, but bittercress control, the broad star was giving us about six weeks. OH2 was going up to 11 weeks. Snapshot was giving us about five weeks. Okay, Phylanthus, the broad star and OH2 were giving us nine to 10 weeks, but snapshot was only giving us three weeks. And, and this is where, uh, or this starts to explain why, you know, we get some weed control, but but for example, when I say that snapshot provided some suppression or only fair or poor control, what we what we really are talking about is the snapshot provided a shorter period of time, a shorter length of weed control, and then the seedlings began to emerge. Now, if you also look at this chart, this graph or this um, table here and start thinking about how many weeks you have between your pre-emergence herbicide applications. Are you reapplying on a eight-week schedule? Are you reapplying on a 12-week schedule? If you're reapplying on a 12-week schedule, the thing you've got to understand is weeds are going to be germinating before you reapply. Now, I'm not advocating that we apply herbicides every two to three weeks. What I am saying here is this explains why some of these weeds are coming up despite our reliance and, and heavy utilization of pre-emergence herbicides. And we just have to be aware of this. And when you're using a, a herbicide that's not quite as effective, you need to make sure that we plan to be out there uh, to, to remove those weeds before they can go to seed. Next. So bottom line is, when do I reapply? You know, in the southern United States, three applications a year is not enough, okay? Um, during the spring, summer, and early fall, you know, we need applications on at least an eight-week cycle. Sometimes that needs to be tightened up onto a six-week cycle with a minimum application of four applications per year, likely in our larger nurseries that are more dependent on residual herbicide use, uh, we're going to be utilizing five and sometimes six applications. Uh, I've had nurserymen say, well, gosh, the, you know, these herbicides are expensive. You know, I can't afford to do that. But the bottom line is you can't afford not to use them because the, the herbicide itself is much less expensive than the labor you spend pulling weeds. All right, so how do we go about refining the system that we've got? Okay, we want to take a look at our products. We want to take a look at herbicide rotations, application timings, and whether we can, we can improve our efficiencies. So let's take a look at a couple of these things. Next, herbicide rotations. Okay, getting to your question before, one of the things that you have to think about in herbicide rotation besides resistance management uh, is the fact that our herbicides uh, have limitations on how many applications per year you can make. For example, oxiflorophan. Any product containing oxiflorophan, you get three applications a year. Okay, um, Broadstar you get two applications a year. Barricade, two applications a year. Snapshot, three per year. Freehand, two per year. Well, what did I just say? You need, you need five applications per year, maybe more. So obviously you have to do some rotations, 
So when you're doing those rotations, let's make sure we're selecting the products that are most effective for that time of year. For example, you know, in the spring and the fall, bittercress is going to be your most problematic weed. So you want to make sure the product that you're using is something like a, a OH2 route, Regal OO, or biathlon. That's going to be very effective on the uh, on the bittercress. In the summer months, you want to make sure you've got something that's going to be very effective on your spurge populations, such as freehand, barricade, broad star, marango. Okay, so you can envision that you can start layering these applications based upon the time of year and the target weeds. Next. All right, so. The target weeds drive your choices, right? In the winter, bitter crest is a given. What else do you have? If you've got pearl wart, snapshot is going to outperform some of the other herbicides. If you have ground sole, OH2 or broad star uh, is, is going to be more effective. Annual bluegrass, snapshot or OH2 are very effective. Oxalis, as much of a problem as oxalis is, it's actually quite easy to control all of our herbicides work on it if you get it out pre-emergence, right? And if you're on the West Coast and you're getting Euphorbia peplus, uh, what we found is that uh, Freehand uh, or, and Broadstar work quite well on Euphorbia peplus or Petty Spurge. Next. In the summer months, whatever you're using, it's got to control Spurge because you know you're going to have it, right? Uh, what else do you have? Do you have Phylanthus? If so, you know, Broadstar might be a good option, uh, or, or Marengo, or if you can't use either of those, then look to Freehand. If you've got Doveweed, the most effective treatment options have been Freehand, Broadstar, or Marengo. If you have Eclipta, Marengo is your top choice, followed by Freehand or Broadstar. Okay. Crabgrass? Is crabgrass a big problem? Summer annual grass is a problem for you. Then something with the dinitroaniline herbicide in the mix can be uh, quite effective, like snapshot or freehand. If you have annual sedges and they're becoming more and more of a problem in the south, then freehand uh, has been one of the most effective, but also the OH tour route uh, and biathlon have been quite effective as well. Next. Now, how, does, how do you put this together for sort of a rotational program? Okay, now here's an example. Here's an example. For uh, pre-emergence weed control in woody crops, we can use broad spectrum products. If we come in in our application one in March, then we'll use an OH2 or a biathlon or something like that at that time of year. We're getting our, our bitter crest. In May, you know, we have still have a lot of bitter crest and spurge is just beginning. So I might move from OH2 to biathlon because biathlon has a little bit of an edge on, on the spurge control. But then in the middle of summer, we've got phylanthus and spurge and eclipta are becoming more of a problem. Then I might rotate Marengo into that system. Getting into September and October, then bittercress will be germinating again, then I might rotate back into the biathlon. Now, you'll see if I follow this rotation, my November application I've got in red because we've just used up all of the oxiflorophin for the year. Between our three applications, OH2 and two applications, uh, one application of OH2, two applications of the biathlon, that's all of the oxiflorophin you can use for the year. So then we've got to rotate to different chemistry at that point. And in that case, I might rotate to Marengo, or you could use a, a, broad, a broad star there. Next. So, you know, here's, uh, you know, here's another rotation. If you have rice flat sedge, for example, rice flat sedge, you know, the, the way this changes is knowing when the rice flat sedge comes on is in May and, and, and June and July, then the biathlon could go first. OH2 works really well on rice flat sedge, and freehand is by far the best treatment on rice flat sedge. So you can pick up all that rice flat sedge, but then by, you know, then you can follow with a biathlon application uh, in, um, in September, and then again, you may have used up your, uh, 
your all of your treatments for uh, for the year for the OH2. Oh, excuse me, for the oxyfluorophen. What about some specific things? And these are just some some options for you to consider. Okay, pre-emergence herbicide program options for shrub roses. You know. So here are, here are three different options, and these, of course, will have to be adjusted because Showcase is now is being phased out of the marketplace. But option one is biathlon, followed by freehand, followed by Marengo, then followed by a biathlon or, or a Showcase or, a, uh, or an OH2 at that point. Now, you'll notice that I don't have a freehand followed by freehand or a Marengo followed by Marengo, and there's a reason for that. And that is crop safety. We have found that if we have freehand followed by freehand or Marengo followed by Marengo, we will we will get some stunting of the shrub roses. Okay. So again, what this these scenarios are focused on is at potting something that's going to give you good uh, bitter crest control, some good safety to your newly transplanted. Uh, uh, liners, and then follow up with something that's going to pick up your spurge or your or your phylanthus or your eclipta that are coming on later in the season. What if what about herbaceous production? Obviously, we have fewer herbicides available, but we still have to think about um, how many of these uh, uh, how, how many treatments we apply. So, for example. You've got daylily production. Daylily is one of our blue-collar perennials that's quite tolerant to a lot of herbicides. In this case, I've got you know, a first application at potting in August, which is what a lot of our growers in this area will do. They'll go snapshot and then follow up with another snapshot application in October. Uh, and then in the middle of winter, again, probably in, in, uh, in Michigan, you're probably not going to be out there spraying gallery and barricade in December. But, you know, we had 60 degrees in December here in North Carolina, so the weeds were still germinating. And at that time, we were able to a liquid application of gallery plus barricade. Now, what you see there is snapshot, snapshot, followed by a gallery barricade application used up all of the gallery that we can for the year. So we've used up all of our, our materials. We can't use any more. For for uh, for a year, so then you could rotate for a spring application of freehand if you needed, and then certainly before May the May the first, you're going to be shipping those plants. So again, you have far fewer products to choose from, but you still have to think about these uh, maximum use rates per year, and then rotating for products that are effective on the weeds you have at that particular time of year. Next. Joe Brad, back to Day Lilies. Brad wants to know if you've seen any uh, damage from Gemini. From Gemini, no. In fact, I've, I've had uh, uh, Gemini on our uh, on Day Lilies uh, in a couple of experiments. And, you know, Gemini has the same active ingredients as Gallery Barricade. So, um, it's those those products have been widely used on uh, on daylilies for a number of years. Um, if you happen to apply that as a spray application right when it's starting to put some flower buds up, it's possible that you could deform some of the uh, the new uh, stalks on this for the flower buds. But otherwise, I've never seen any problems. All right, very good. Next. All righty, so. Regardless of which pre-emergence herbicide you use, you obviously you want to select the right product. You want to treat immediately, you know, or very soon after potting. Our research has shown that uh, spurge can germinate within four to five days. So if you wait a week or two weeks to treat, you may have already missed your spurge and bittercress uh, emergence. Also, we want you to hand weed frequently to prevent seed production. I've got more to say on that in a moment. And of course, apply your herbicides uniformly. You know, if you don't apply them uniformly, they're not going to work for you. And we've done collections in commercial nurseries and seen that 
your your distribution of granules is quite variable in nurseries, uh, up to 250% variation from one square foot to the next uh, in the distribution of granules. So uh, the secret to getting good granular distribution is actually to try to go over the area multiple times at lighter dosing. Don't try to do it in one pass. You minimum of two passes, four passes is actually even better. And I know that takes time and time is money. Next. Now, I said I wanted to say a little more about weeding frequency. If you let the weeds go, they're going to go to seed, they're going to have new populations. When you first pot up a, a crop, and it's got a few weeds in it, it is just a few weeds. But if those weeds go to seed, then you've got a lot more weeds to deal with later on. Okay, so I'm an advocate of frequent hand weeding to try to infuse sanitation into your weed control program. Next. So here is a picture at a, one of our on-farm experiments. The picture on the left is the pile of weeds we removed from one of our blocks of, of plants. And this, this block of plants was treated with a pre-emergence herbicide, all right? But on the left is the pile of weeds that was there. If all we did was treat with pre-emergence herbicide and then wait, and then pull the weeds before it was time to reapply herbicides at about six to eight weeks. Okay, on the right hand side of this is the pile of weeds that we removed if we go through there and pull the weeds every two weeks. You know, picture's worth a thousand words there, I think. You know, if you maintain sanitation, you're going to dramatically reduce the amount of weeds uh, that are in your crop. Next. And this is just a chart that shows what happened over time, the, the you know, uh, pulling weeds every eight weeks versus going in and pulling them every two weeks. Yes, you still have weeds, even if you're going in there every two weeks and pulling weeds, but over time, you know, this is, these are the man hours that were spent pulling those weeds. And we can see in this research that we did, we reduced the, the man hours required to remove those weeds. We reduced that by over 50% by going out there and weeding every two weeks compared to just weeding when the pots were weedy and time to reapply an herbicide. So this day and time, you know, our, our business, the economy, our businesses are turning around. The economy is better, all right? Cash flow is better. The crops are selling. I think it's time for us to take a closer look at uh, this particular practice. Uh, you know, we lost a lot of our labor. We cut a lot of things back. But now if we can take a look at our, at our, how we use our labor and see if we can't use it more efficiently, hopefully, hopefully we can decrease the actual labor costs that we put towards weeding. And Joe, I, I venture a guess that it's a less arduous job for those doing the weeding to do it more often rather than once every eight weeks, based on the pile that I saw. Uh, you you would think so, but I, I must say that you know when you're going out there and you you have to do it every two weeks, nobody likes weeding. Just nobody likes to weed. We we know that. Well, maybe there's some odd people out there that do, but you know, but to say that we're going to do it even more frequently is a lot of times it's a hard sell. Okay, and you've really got to show a long-term impact, and so hopefully. Some of the attendees here today will will give this a try, at least on some areas in their nursery. Let me know how it goes. I know at least one attendee has been doing this very successfully. Okay, next. Oh, there we are. So, so the cumulative weeding times we've done this. Uh, several times with our with on our research farm, but this is just a chart. We got the same results when we did it at an on-farm test. But I want to point out that early in the season, in the first eight weeks, we really didn't see much of a difference. It was only in that longer-term crop where we're getting an increase of weed populations over time. Do we see the real benefits of this frequent weeding? 
All right. So you, you don't see the benefits right away, but you see the benefits as the season progresses. So again, going 14 weeks into the season, you start to really see the differences. Uh, whereas earlier in the season, you really don't pick up a difference between these two strategies. Seth is wondering if it doesn't interrupt the, the herbicide barrier by weeding more frequently. Well, that's a good question. Um, we have not seen that. Uh, I think, of course, every time you go out there and weed, you're going to disrupt the barrier. But I think the benefits of of reducing your seed populations have outweighed the the negative aspects of of the disturbance. And again, we're going out on full and pulling very young weeds, which has less disturbance than pulling big weeds. Right. That's a good well, question, though. We got to keep moving. We're running, running a little late, but everybody's sticking with I'm you. Sorry, no, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm a little a long-winded. Topic. I'm long-winded. I apologize. We're going to finish it up here. So this just sort of wraps it up. When you know, weeding frequently versus when it's weedy, we had a 50 to 80 percent reduction in weeds, uh, up to a 60 percent reduction in time spent weeding. But at one site, we didn't reduce the uh, the time required for weeding at all. Okay, why? That was pretty clean nursery. The good news is, under no circumstances did we ever increase the amount of time you spent out there weeding by, by going more frequently. You have only positive returns on uh, on this. So overall, the average was a 30% reduction of weeding. Yeah. Now, of course, the challenge is labor management. You know, we all are, are dealing with that in, in nurseries now, limited labor. So you really have to, if you decide to do this, you really have to make it a commitment to stay on cycle. If you miss a cycle of, on that two-week weeding, it's hard to catch up because the weeds have gone to seed already by the time you get back. So next. So to be effective, this frequent weeding really needs to be part of the overall management plan. So once you get those weeds out of there, don't just throw them on the ground next to your crop because these seeds will spread and go into your crop again. So get them out of there, get them off the, off the site so they can't spread on the nursery. And yes, I'm sorry. I, no, it's perfect. Uh, Everybody uh, was hanging time. on. It's great information, and uh, this is as many questions as I've gotten in quite a while. So let's uh, let's tackle some of them. Um, okay. Let's talk about specific uh, um, weeds. How about mugwort? Recommendations to control mugwort. Oh my goodness, mugwort. Um, I'm working on the assumption that this question is for field nursery uh, production. So what we found is, you know, that. There's really nothing better than glyphosate, but that glyphosate needs to be applied in the spring and the fall. Okay, and during the summer months, you can do some cleanup applications, but you actually want a little bit of the mugwort vegetation present in, in September time frame. You can do your apl uh, glyphosate application at least a, uh, a two quart per acre uh, rate at that time. Two years in a row, spring and fall applications, we had 95 to 98 percent control. Now, one thing you've got to remember there is if you are cultivating the middles between your rows, you're spreading the mugwort. So you've, if you've got mugwort in the fields, you've got to stop cultivating. Okay, go go to a, uh, a different uh, between row management system, put some, some covers, uh, uh, some grass cover in there or something like that. But before you do that, let the mugwort grow up a little bit and spray it all because it spreads underground by rhizome. Now, if you are producing uh, shade trees or uh, um, arborvitae or junipers or taxis in the field, uh, Casseron applied in the winter, in the dead of winter, can be a very effective tool in suppressing mugwort in the field. All right, let's, um, I'm going back to some of the earlier questions, folks have been on the line the longest. Mark wants to know about, is there a risk using 
um, sanit sanitation treatments, herbicides, in gravel areas immediately outside greenhouse air intake vents? Well, that's a good question, Mark. And, you know, I, I think some, some, um, some good old-fashioned common sense uh, is often a good thing to apply to these situations. Uh, if you're spraying around the greenhouse, uh, it's always a good idea to to shut the uh, the fans down so you're not drawing any spray in there. Because most of the time, let's face it, if you're spraying weeds around the greenhouse, you probably have a combination of Roundup with SureGuard or Marengo or something like that, right? So it's best not to draw that into the greenhouse. Now, the good news is uh, these herbicides that are labeled for uh, use in nurseries are not volatile. So we've, I've never seen a problem with, with Marengo, SureGuard, or, uh, or Barricade applied outside the greenhouse for sanitation. Uh, they, they just don't volatilize and go in. Now, I strong, would strongly suggest we look at, well, what could be used inside the greenhouse, we, and one of those herbicides right now at least can be used for sanitation treatments inside the greenhouse, and that is Marengo. It does not volatilize. Now, you cannot use it in your crop in a covered house, but you can use it as a sanitation treatment under benches and around the foundation inside a covered house. All right. Speaking of greenhouses, how about controlling bittercress in a greenhouse, um, primarily on annuals and perennials? Philip wants to know that. Sanitation, sanitation, sanitation. In your, um, it, you know, the main thing there is, is the bittercress is shooting its seed up to six feet away. So look all over the place and how to how do you manage the bittercress that's growing in the gravel? Before you set uh, any plants into that house, I would you know, make sure that you, you clean up the existing weeds. Um, you can use uh, Marengo as an application for pre-emergence uh, bittercress control in those situations. Water it in, uh, and then you can set flats on that gravel uh, area. But look to, look to the perimeter, look to areas around where support structures are. You know, all those little spots where the bittercress grows and can shoot its seed. Watch those. If you see any emergence, try and get in there and spot spray with uh, a post-emergence treatment such as Reward or Diquat uh, or um, pelargonic acid, Scythe can be used inside the greenhouse for that. And, you know, if you, uh, if you want to use more natural approaches inside the greenhouse, natural product approaches, you can use vinegar, horticultural vinegar, or several of these uh, natural oils are quite effective. They're just a little more expensive to use uh, than the uh, reward. All right, we've got uh, a crop specific question, peonies. Herbicides for peonies. Herbicides for peonies. Peonies are actually quite tolerant. Uh, if we're we're talking about a, 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 a division, so I've done I've done more work with container-grown peonies, and we have used uh, Snapshot, we've used Gallery Barricade, we've used Surflan with no injury. So those would be the ones I would consider. In fact, a, a Gallery Surflan application can be an effective uh, treatment. Uh, for weed control. Uh, under field-grown conditions, we do have some uh, field-grown uh, uh, peony, uh, and I have not worked with that as much, but I know that the field producers uh, have used some other herbicides that, um, that we don't use in containers. So a bit of clarification, whoever asked that question, are you a field producer or a container producer? Uh, they're asking about a pre, uh, pre-merge. That's all the question uh, indicates. Okay. So, so I would do a gallery, you know, a gallery surfland, gallery barricade uh, application. We have also, uh, we've used, um, uh, so again, the gallery barricade, so your Gemini should be just fine as well. Pendulum uh, can be used all, uh, instead, so a gallery pendulum application will work as well. All right, Joe, what are you going to be doing this afternoon? 
this afternoon. It's going to be out pulling weeds. The reason I ask is <laughs> the <laughs> questions are rolling in hot and heavy, and we're uh, we're 15 minutes over our allotted time already, and there's no way, even though I promised, I'm sorry, folks, we can get to all of them, uh, let alone even the oldest ones and not the new ones rolling in. But uh, in a couple of slides, we're going to post your email address, Joe, and so I'm hoping you'd be gracious enough, if not this afternoon, but, but uh, as soon as you could, if anybody has a question that wasn't answered or one pops up, email it to Joe, and I know he'll shoot you back what he, what he can, right? Free of yes. charge, sponsored by BASF. Send them the bill. Send, send, <laughs> uh, send it to me. Uh, there he is. You know, at, at my address there, and uh, you can send it to jcneal at ncsu.edu. Uh, or if you just type my name into your search engine, you will almost surely my website will pop up. And I encourage you all to do that anyway, because you know if you're asking questions about, well, which herbicide might I use on this species or this crop, or which herbicide is effective on on my weed in particular, uh, on my website I have tables of that information that we have pulled together uh, uh, between. Uh, um, my colleagues Jeff Durr at Virginia Tech and Dr. Andy Sinisak at uh, at Cornell University and uh, Dr. Chris Marble at Florida, we've collaborated and put this information together on tables and charts. And so those are all available free for download or access from my website. Well, that's the easiest beautiful. way to get there is just type my name into the search engine and see what you get. So this, see, this is just the beginning of the weed resources for all these folks. Not just this webinar is just the tip of the iceberg for what you're going to learn from Dr. Neal. So that, I, uh, I greatly appreciate all the time. Now, if you, uh, if you had to leave early, or as many of you, if you uh, want to go back and uh, and look again at some of those charts and tables and graphs and photos and things like that, you will be able to do that uh, pretty shortly. Hopefully within the half hour, 45 minutes or so, at ballpublishing.com/webinars. Uh, and again, a special thanks to our uh, sponsor, BASF, who made this possible. So that said, for, uh, for Joe and all of his weed-pulling technicians making those piles, and all of my folks here at Ball Publishing, this is Chris Bates saying so long, everybody. Thank you all.